Let me begin this segment with a bit of a warning. Uh, this segment of the video series will entail the engineering design of the gearbox and uh, all of its parts and pieces. And the engineering design necessarily includes the mathematics uh, uh, that's necessary in order to determine the properties, the mechanical and operational properties of the various parts of the machine. Now, engineers eat this stuff up, but I realize that a lot of people find it intimidating. You may or may not be able to follow it, uh, but if you can't, I hope at the very least it'll give you an idea of what engineers do on a daily basis in order to bring the various marvels of the modern world to reality. Uh, it's my sincere hope that you'll enjoy it. Gears are an essential part of the modern world. They're in everything around you from clocks to power plants, from airplanes to submarines. They work so well you hardly notice them. And the reason they work so well is because people have been working on them, perfecting them, for hundreds of years. In the past 200 years, they've evolved into marvelous devices that can spin at hundreds of thousands of RPMs and last for decades of service. Gear design began in earnest in the Industrial Revolution during the 19th century. The methodical and scientifically based design of gears began with the work of Wilfred Lewis in 1892. He analyzed gears using new techniques of material science which treated a gear tooth as a beam supported at one end, a cantilever. He realized that if a designer knew the bending strength of the material that formed the gear tooth, one could predict how much the tooth would bend when subjected to the load presented by a mating gear. If he could predict how much it would bend, he could predict the load at which it would fail. He created a mathematical method for quantifying that load that has come to be known as the Lewis Equation. Let me walk you through the Lewis equation and how it works. The Lewis equation says that the bending force, that is the force that's imposed on the tooth by mating with the gear that it's mating with, is going to be equal to the allowable stress for the material that we're working in, in this case aluminum, multiplied times the thickness of the tooth, which is the same thing as the thickness of the gear, and that's multiplied times the Lewis form factor, which comes from a table I'll describe to you, divided by the diametral pitch. Applying the Lewis equation is relatively straightforward, but the designer must realize that it's a simplification that only partially accounts for the forces acting on the gears, and it should only be used if great accuracy is not required. Now the American Gear Manufacturers Association, otherwise known as AGMA, has developed a method of designing gears that takes many of these other factors into account. It's a modification of the Lewis equation. It compensates for some of Lewis's erroneous assumptions, plus some other important factors that the Lewis equation doesn't consider, principally the wear on the surface of the tooth caused by the pressure of the gear teeth rolling and sliding over one another. I'm not going to cover the AGMA gear equation further except to say that it is available in AGMA Information Sheet 225.01. Now I intend to cut the gears for this project from aluminum because it's light and it's strong. However, aluminum is not used in most commercially produced gears because it's not able to resist surface wear nearly as well as steel. I intend to anodize the gears, which will harden them somewhat, but the gears in this device will not last as long as steel gears would. It's a trade-off for the aluminum's light weight. I'll not use the AGMA technique here because it doesn't apply to the design of aluminum gears. I intend to design the gear teeth to be strong enough to resist the bending forces, plus a considerable factor of safety, and that should prevent a catastrophic failure. So the first task in the design of our gears is to determine the forces that are going to act on the gears. And we can determine the forces using this equation right here, which says that torque, 
is equal to 63,000 times horsepower divided by RPM. And as used in this equation, torque is expressed in inch pounds. And the power input into the system is expressed in horsepower. And the rotation rate is expressed in revolutions per minute. Let me just say something quickly about torque, if you're not familiar with torque. Torque is the way that force is expressed in a rotating system, and it's calculated by multiplying the force applied times the distance from the center of rotation to the point where the force is applied. And it's typically expressed in the English system in foot-pounds or inch-pounds. So we've calculated that the torque in the system will be equal to 50 inch-pounds. For the sake of being conservative, I'm going to apply a factor of safety of 2 to this, and I'm going to adopt a design torque of 100 inch-pounds. Now, as I stated a moment ago, force is equal to torque times radius. And we know that radius is equal to the diameter divided by 2. We can use those to calculate the force on the gear tooth by simply noting that force would be equal to the torque times the diameter divided by 2. And since the design torque is 100 inch-pounds and that the design diameter, pitch diameter, is 1.5 inches, we can calculate the force, F, to be 75 pounds. Now, since we know the force on the tooth, we can now use the Lewis equation to check whether the actual forces exceed the strength of the tooth. To do that, we have to know the maximum allowable stress for aluminum in the gear tooth. Now, I've chosen the aluminum alloy 6061T6 because it's very strong, easily machined, reasonably priced, and readily available. Now, here I'm showing the specifications for 6061T6, and it shows that the ultimate tensile strength of this material is 45,000 psi, that's pounds per square inch, which gives us a yield strength of about 40,000 psi. Um, the rest of these numbers are the, the actual composition of 6061. That's not as important as knowing that 6061 is as strong as many steels are in terms of its ultimate strength and its its yield strength. However, its its elasticity is different than steel in that it will stretch more readily, and that's expressed in its Young's modulus or its modulus of elasticity, which is considerably lower than that of steel. Now, for our purposes here. I'm going to derate the strength of the material somewhat and use 33,000 PSI's a maximum allowable bending stress for the Lewis equation. The next thing we have to do is calculate the strength of the tooth is the number of teeth on the gear and the size or the base area of the gear tooth. Gear design is a trial and error process that begins with an assessment of the requirements for the gear. Gears with large teeth are strong, but they don't mesh as smoothly or and they're noisier and vibrate more than gears with many teeth. Gears with many small teeth run smoother, but the teeth are not as strong and they're harder to make than gears with larger teeth. We need a compromise between these competing factors. Since I know the diameter of the gear will be one and a half inches, the circumference will be 1.5 pi or 4.7 inches. If I choose 24 teeth, then each tooth will be approximately two-tenths of an inch long, and I know I can mill that tooth with the equipment that I have. If we're going to settle on a tooth number of 24, then we can calculate the diametral pitch using this equation. The diametral pitch is equal to the number of teeth divided by the diameter, or in our case, 24 teeth divided by 1.5, which is equal to 16 and which we'll henceforth refer to as P, the diametral pitch. The Lewis form factor for a 24-tooth, 20-degree 20 gear is 
and I'm referring here to the Lewis form factor table. This is an example of the Lewis form factor table. It was extracted from a book that I've had for many years that I actually used as a text when I was in engineering school. And it's uh, the title of the, of the book is Machine Design Theory and Practice um, by Deutschman and Michaels. In any event, if we come down this chart to, to the number in the number of teeth column to 24 and then read over to the right we can uh, observe from the table that the Lewis form factor for a 20 degree spur gear with a 16 diametral pitch is point, 0 0.572. The last thing we need to do is choose the thickness of the gear or the thickness of the gear tooth which is represented in the Lewis equation as the factor B. In this case the thicker the gear the stronger the gear but it'll all take up more space and it'll be heavier. I'm going to start with a B is equal to a quarter of an inch 0.25 inches because it should be relatively easy to make and it should provide sufficient strength. So the solved Lewis equation therefore is shown right here where we're using 33,000 PSI as the allowable stress for aluminum 6061. B is 0.25 inches and this is why the Lewis form factor divided by the diametral pitch and it tells us that the force on the gear tooth will be approximately 294 pounds. No, I, I've said that wrong. It doesn't mean that the force on the tooth will be 294 pounds. It means that the tooth should be able to endure as much as 294 pounds before it fails in bending. Since we know from our previous calculation that the load on the tooth is only 75 pounds, the tooth size that I've chosen should operate with a factor of safety of approximately 3.9. This is a very ample safety margin which should adequately protect these gears from failure. So this is the gear that we're left with. It's one and a half inches in diameter on its pitch circle and it's a quarter of an inch thick. It has 24 teeth. It has a diametral pitch of 16. The next factor to consider here will be the de design of the gear shafts and the bearings that are on those shafts. These gears are rotated at a relatively high speed. In gearing any velocity in excess of 3600 RPM is considered high velocity. However, RPM is not as important as the velocity at which the gears mesh. Gear designers call this the pitch line velocity and expressed in feet per minute. It can be determined by multiplying RPM by pi over 12 times the pitch diameter. Here, with one and a half inch pitch diameter, the pitch line velocity will be 2472 RPM. And although the RPM is high, gear designers would label a 2400 foot per minute pitch line velocity as moderately high. Keeping the pitch line velocity as low as possible is another reason to keep the gears as small as possible. But smaller gears limit the space available for the bearings on the shafts. In this design, some of the bearings have to be smaller diameter than the gears to allow the gears to mesh. This is particularly true for the main bearings that support the outer shaft, which run in between the lower main gear and the upper main gear. Smaller bearings take up less space and weigh less, but they're harder to cool and they're harder to lubricate. In this design, there are especially tight requirements for the bearings 
that are actually between the contra-rotating shafts. Let's continue the design process by looking at the design of the most problematic shaft in this system, which is the inner shaft from the motor through the gearbox to the outer propeller. Since this shaft is inside the outer shaft, it needs to be as small as possible. We know that the design torque on this shaft is 100 inch pounds. I would prefer to make this shaft from aluminum, but steel will be a viable alternative. I'll start by assuming a diameter of 0.25 inches because the bearings in this size are very easy to obtain. The first thing we need to do is calculate the maximum torsional stress in the shaft due to the forces applied by rotation. We can do that by applying this equation, where tau, the Greek symbol tau, represents the torsional stress in the inner shaft in pounds per square inch. T is the maximum torque applied to the shaft, and D is the shaft diameter. In this case, if D is equal to 0.25 and T is equal to 100 inch pounds, tau will equal 3,295 pounds per square inch. Recall that the yield stress, or the maximum allowable stress for 6061 aluminum is 33,000 PSI. And although that allowable stress had been derated, I believe that 32,000 is still too close to the maximum allowable stress for aluminum. Also, the equation that I previously showed you is a simplification that does not consider the stress on the shaft from bending, which will increase the maximum stress somewhat. Therefore, this shaft needs to be made of steel. And a review of steels available reveals that ASTM 4340 chrome alloy steel has a yield strength of 125,000 PSI. And ASTM 4130 alloy steel has a yield strength of 110,000 PSI. Both of these steels are available in small diameter rounds and are readily machinable. Therefore, I will choose one of them as the material for the inner shaft. To stay as conservative as possible, we'll do the calculation using the yield strength for 4130. Another factor that shaft designers need to consider is the critical speed of the shaft. The operating speed of the shaft should be lower than the critical speed to prevent dangerous vibrations. The critical speed is related to the bending loads on the shaft and the bending deflections in the shaft caused by those loads. Bending might come from side loads imposed upon the bearings from other elements in the design. Here, however, the major loading is all torsional loading created by the propellers, which are located on the ends of both the inner and the outer shaft. Some bending loads can be expected in any case, but they are small in magnitude when compared to the torsional loading on this shaft. Also, any bending loads are likely to be imposed close to the bearings where the shafts are better supported. And finally, and very importantly, the inner shaft is actually contained within and supported by the outer shaft which itself is supported by external bearings. Therefore, I think it's safe to ignore the critical speed of the inner shaft for now. The next step in the design of the shaft is to de determine the torsional deflection or how much the shaft will twist under load. Torsional deflection can be calculated using this equation where theta is the torsional deflection in radians. The torque is the maximum design torque, which we know is 50 inch-pounds. The length is the length of the shaft in inches 
Here it'll be an approximation that we will start by assuming it's six inches. J is the polar moment of inertia, and G is the modulus of rigidity, or the shear modulus. And for steel, this is 11,600,000 pounds. Now I realize that this one is a bit of a mouthful, but if we break it down, you'll find that it's not that complex. The components in this equation that you haven't seen before are J, the polar moment of inertia, expressed in inches to the fourth. A solid round shaft has a polar moment of inertia equal to pi divided by 32 times the diameter of the shaft to the fourth power. So what is the polar moment of inertia? And what, what does it mean in this equation? The best way to think about the polar moment of inertia is to realize that in a rotational system, the ability of the material to resist torsional forces is related to how far that material is from the center of rotation. The farther away from the center of rotation that the material exists, the more it resists the torsional forces. And the polar moment of inertia is intended to express that in a precise way. If we do this calculation, we'll discover that the polar moment of inertia of the inner shaft is 0 0.000383 inches to the fourth. The last element in this equation is G. And G is the modulus for rigidity, or the shear modulus. The modulus of rigidity is a mathematical expression for the stretchiness or the springiness of the material when it's uh, subjected to shearing forces. In a round shaft, the forces tend to be shearing forces as opposed to bending forces. And so therefore engineers use the shearing modulus rather than the Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity. This material property is well known, and for all steels, it's approximately 11,600,000 pounds per square inch. So if we examine this equation more closely, we can see that the, that the amount that the shaft deflects around the center line of the shaft is going to be directly proportional to the torque imposed, that is the forces that have been imposed to twist the shaft, and it's going to be directly proportional to the length of the shaft. It's going to be inversely proportional to the polar moment of inertia, which makes sense because if the larger the shaft, the higher the polar moment, the smaller the deflection. And the same is true for the, the modulus of rigidity. The higher the, the rigidity of the material, the less likely it is to twist and that makes the, the amount of twist inversely proportional to it. If we do the calculations and multiply by 57.3 degrees per radian, we get this equation. And we determine that the torsional deflection will be 3.8 degrees. Recall that a radian is an angular measurement of the amount of angle subtended by a distance along the circumference of a circle equal to the radius. So we've calculated that under maximum load this shaft should deflect torsionally by approximately 3.8 or around 4 degrees. Now this is equivalent to 0.63 degrees per inch of length. And that's a considerable deflection and it's higher than the maximum recommended deflection of one degree and 20 times the shaft diameter, which would be one degree and five inches or 0.2 degrees per inch. However, in our design, remember that the majority of the deflection will take place in the shaft after the input gear, and there's a propeller attached 
to the output end of the shaft. And since a propeller is not particularly sensitive to deflection, coupled with the fact that we really can't do much more about the deflection with the size of the shaft that we have, I think that we can safely ignore the fact that this is would be traditionally considered excessively tor excessive torsional deflection. Engineering is often the process of determining what you can safely ignore and what you can safely not ignore. So I'll briefly summarize. The inner shaft will be 0.25 inches in diameter, approximately 6 inches long. We'll refine that number as we move forward. It'll be made of ASTM 4130 alloy steel. It'll be supported by a ball bearing unit in the base plate and another ball bearing unit which will be located on the end of the outer shaft. The inner shaft will convey torque from the motor on the input side of the system all the way out to the front propeller on the front of the system. Well, congratulations if you've made it this far. I realize that some of the stuff can get a little dense, but at the very least, you should come away with an understanding of what engineers go through in order to bring us the technology that makes up our modern world. We're almost done, but we have to take a closer look at the design of the outer shaft and the bearings that lie between the inner shaft and the outer shaft and also the bearings between the outer shaft and the supporting structure of the gearbox. I'm going to start this with a closer view of the upper bearing that lies between the inner shaft and the outer shaft. Now let me remove the outer shaft so that you can get a better look at what the bearing looks like. Let's take a closer look at this bearing and what it's made of. As I said, I've chosen rolling bearings or ball bearings for this design because they are compact, they're efficient, they're inexpensive, and they're very effective at supporting uh, both lateral or radial loads and to some degree thrust loads. The bearing consists of two steel rings, the, which are called the inner race and the outer race. And in between the two are a set of small steel balls. Now in this case I've chosen a flanged bearing. The bearing has a little flange here on the top that will allow it to sit on the top of the outer shaft. But like all bearings, it still has to have support for the outer race, which is independent of the support for the inner race because one race is usually turning and the other one is not. In this case, both races will be turning, but in opposite directions. The biggest cause of bearing failure is an improper fit between the inner race and the shaft that runs through the inner race. And this is usually caused by tolerances which are too loose and allow the shaft to begin to wobble inside the race or it allows the shaft to spin inside the race. Either one of these situations is fatal for the bearing and can be fatal in just a mere couple of seconds. Also, this rolling bearing has got to be lubricated somehow. This is typically accomplished, typically accomplished by oil, which is present in and around the, uh, ro the balls, but it can also be accomplished by grease. Grease, after all, is really nothing more than oil which has been thickened with, a, with a, what's known as a saponifying agent. The effect of the lubrication, of course, is to reduce the friction uh, between the balls and the race by creating a thin film between the outside of the ball and the inside of the race. So the first thing that we have to do is ensure that there is an interference fit between the inner race 
and the inner shaft. Now this interference fit is usually accomplished by making the bearing seat, which is part of the inner shaft, slightly larger than the diameter of the inner race. And slightly larger means approximately uh, five ten thousandths of an inch, about a half a thousandth. And that of course means that the bearing won't simply slide over the shaft. Getting the bearing over the shaft can be tricky and it's often accomplished by heating the bearing up so that the inner race expands a small amount and then sliding it over the shaft and allowing it to contract back on the shaft in the correct position. Now here, the inner shaft of the bearing that I've chosen has an in, the inner race of the bearing that I have chosen has an inside diameter of 0.25 inches. And as we have previously noted, the inner shaft has an outside diameter also of 0.25 inches. Having both the same diameter won't produce an interference fit. It will produce a tight sliding fit which we'll have to accept in this situation because the inner shaft comes from the steel mill, the manufacturer, uh, with an outside diameter of exactly 0 0.250 inches, as does the race of the inner bearing, considering that it's very difficult for me to machine precisely a, th a small diameter shaft to an accuracy of a half a thousandth of an inch, we're simply going to have to accept the sliding fit between the inner shaft and the inner race of the bearing. However, because we don't have an interference fit, we need to provide some mechanism to stop the inner bearing race from sliding up and down on the inner shaft. Now I have elected to do that here with snap rings or retaining rings. And here you can see the, a retaining ring groove has been placed just above the inner race of the bearing. Here you can see the upper snap ring in place. The inner shaft also has a lower bearing and it's located at the bottom of the shaft and it's based in the base plate of the gearbox housing. It too is a rolling bearing, a ball bearing. Note that we have the same problem with it that we had with the upper bearing in that we have to fit it over, the, we have to fit the inner race over the top of the inner shaft and they're both exactly the same diameter which means we'll also have a sliding fit between this inner race and the inner shaft. Now the outer race of this bearing will reside within a bearing cup that will be cut into the base of the housing such that we will have a loose interference fit between the outside of the outer race and the bearing cup. Now at this point you may be thinking what about the thrust loads that are being imposed upon this inner shaft by the propellers and what's to stop this inner shaft from simply sliding up and down inside this bearing race. For now it appears that the only practical way to do that is to add snap rings to both the top and the bottom of the lower bearing. The snap rings, which spin with the shaft and the inner race, will transfer the thrust loads from the inner shaft to the lower bearing. But we will still need some positive mechanism to transfer those thrust loads from the outer race of the lower bearing to the housing bottom. At present, I intend to do that with a set screw in the bearing, in the side of the bearing cup in the lower housing. So those two bearings account for the top and bottom support of the inner shaft. But what about the support of the outer shaft? 
what keeps it from flopping around here on the bottom? Obviously, we're going to need a bearing here too, and we're going to need a very solid support to hold that bearing. Since the thrust loads from the propellers, the propeller on the inner shaft are transmitted to the outer shaft, and then combined with the thrust forces of the propeller on the outer shaft, it needs to be able to support the entire thrust loads for both propellers. To do that, I've chosen a deep groove rolling bearing, which is capable of supporting both radial and thrust loads. It's a larger, stronger bearing because the inner shaft is larger and because the loads are larger. But it needs to be connected directly to the housing to provide a reaction force for those thrust loads. We'll do that with the outer shaft main bearing support, which will be tied into the housing via screws. This part will be made from aluminum and the outer race of the outer main bearing will be press fit into it with an interference fit. Finally, we need to have some structural element to tie the upper bearings on both the inner and outer shafts into the housing. And to do that, we're going to provide yet another bearing on the outside of the outer shaft. For this, I've chosen a, a needle roller bearing, primarily because of its small diameter, which will allow it to fit between the outer shaft and the supporting member that will tie it into the main part of the housing. That support will be provided by another member, an aluminum tube, which will be securely fastened to the top plate of the housing which will hold and secure the outer shaft upper needle bearing. So here are the shafts and their bearings and supporting systems. The inner shaft, the outer shaft, the outer shaft support structure, the housing, and the bearings on all three. Examining this drawing shows you what will prove to be one of the most difficult parts of the construction of this machine, and that is to keep the alignment of all these shafts and bearings exactly aligned around this central axis. And that's going to have to be done to a very high degree of precision in order for this machine to work without tearing itself apart. We also have to deal with the issue of bearing lubrication. Although most of the bearings are inside the gearbox, the gearbox itself is not oil tight because it doesn't have seals on the top and bottom where the shafts enter and exit. If we try and lubricate the gearbox with oil, which would be the most effective means to do it, the oil would simply leak out alongside the shafts. Although this, although this could be prevented by adding seals, uh, perhaps a labyrinth seal on either end, that's excessively complicated and will add to the weight and construction difficulties of this unit. So therefore I think we'll lubricate this gearbox with grease and we'll have to determine an appropriate high speed grease that we can pack into all of the bearings and provide sufficient lubrication to run for as long as we need to run. So there you have it. Uh, that's the design that we're going to proceed with. Obviously the design is going to be refined somewhat as we move along this process. One of the things that I haven't shown in these drawings is how we're going to attach the propellers to the shafts. Both the inner and the outer shaft will have to be threaded so that the propeller hubs can slide over the top and have retaining nuts uh, put on, the retaining nuts and washers put on them in order to hold the propellers in place over the outside of the shafts.
So what we've got is a small, complex mechanism that's going to be carrying considerable horsepower, containing a bunch of moving parts, rotating at very high RPM. Now, as I said in the beginning of this series, I've never laid out a gearbox before, so I don't know if this is the best way to do it. There are probably many other ways to accomplish the same thing. However, I did do some research into the design of the gearbox in the Mark 16 Spitfire, which uses a Rolls-Royce Griffin engine and a contra-rotating gearbox. It too uses a similar set of idlers to achieve contra-rotation, but they're arranged somewhat differently at the front section of the Griffin. The goal here is to design the gearbox to meet the performance specifications that we've laid out. And if we can do that, it'll be successful regardless of the other ways that it might have been done. I thank you if you've managed to stay with me all the way through this rather long and tedious design process. From here on in, we're going to move into the construction of the various parts, assembly, and finally testing. That's when we're going to find out whether the assumptions that I've made in the design process were really justified. We'll see you next time.